Los seres humanos somos por naturaleza seres que cooperamos entre nosotros. La forma en que cooperamos, sin embargo, puede ser muy importante. Podemos cooperar por obligación, por la coerción del Estado, pero también podemos cooperar simple y sencillamente porque esto nos conviene. Entender cómo cooperamos es una de las formas más importantes para entender cómo podemos progresar en lo económico. Yo quiero agradecer la presencia en este programa de Anthony Davis. Él es miembro distinguido de la Fundación para la Educación Económica. Es profesor de la Universidad Duquesne de Pensilvania, allá en Pittsburgh, en, en, en uh, los Estados Unidos. Eh, él ha, de hecho, participado en una serie de de cursos y de trabajos para entender cómo funciona la economía. Recientemente eh, escribió con James Harrigan un libro que ha generado mucho interés en los medios económicos. El libro es Cooperación y Coerción. Vamos a hacer esta conversación en inglés. Anthony Davis, thank you very much for speaking uh, with us. And uh, one of the points that you and Mr. Harrigan say is that uh, we can cooperate willingly, but we can also Uh, we, we, sometimes we need to have coercion. Is, is this a necessity? Do we, can, can we have a government that coerces us to cooperate? Yes, it, it turns out that coercion is necessary. Um, it's necessary at, at, the, at the base level to prevent people from imposing harm on each other. So you don't want me dumping my trash in your yard. I don't want other people stealing from my shop. And so we use coercion to prevent that, to stop people from harming each other. But what we have found as we look at various countries throughout the world, as we look throughout history, what we see is repeating pattern. Governments that restrict themselves just to preventing people from harming each other tend to prosper. Those societies prosper much more so than do societies where the governments go too far and, and do things beyond simply uh, uh, preventing people from harming each other, or uh, societies that, in which governments do less, that they don't even prevent people from harming each other. This is what we seem to see as the right mix of cooperation and coercion. I assume that in a society where there's no coercion at all, uh, we have a uh... Uh, the law of the jungle is just the strongest, the strongest survives. Yes, I think so. In, in fact, probably that's a good way to put it, that if you don't have the government using its coerc coercive power to prevent people from harming each other, people will use their own individual coercive power uh, and, and then you, society falls apart. And so what, what's happening here is a problem goes all the way back to, to Aristotle and Socrates of realizing that human beings are simultaneously individuals and members of a shared society. And what we're talking about here with cooperation and coercion is balancing those two roles of the person as individual and as member of shared society. What are the mechanisms by which we cooperate willingly? Cooperation, we tend not to notice because it happens so frequently. Everything from um, a Friday night poker game to uh, your, your parish church community to buying and selling things in a marketplace, all of these are cooperative ventures in instances in which people come together voluntarily. And if the, if the transaction, if the relationship is mutually beneficial, then people will continue with this relationship. I'll come back to the church. I'll come back to this store to purchase more things. But if the relationship is not mutually beneficial, one or the other of us is free to walk away. And, and so what happens is because the relationships are, are based on voluntary mutual cooperation, um, relationships that work out that are beneficial will tend to persist while those that aren't won't. Do we cooperate more with our families and people that are immediate to us? I know that we tend to have a, a distrust of uh, foreigners, a distrust of the stranger. Do, do we cooperate more with people that are closer to us? I think so. You have a tendency to cooperate more with your family than with your neighbors and more with your neighbors than with people outside of your community and more so with people within your country than with people outside. And this is where one of the of the fantastic powers of uh, free trade comes in. The more countries trade with each other, 
the less strange we become to each other. And so you're in Mexico and I'm in the United States and we exchange goods and services. And I get to know you and I start to trust you and you get to know me and you start to trust me. And as a consequence, our two governments will be unable to, to, to wage war against each other because the people have come to know each other. And we see this repeated throughout history. Countries that engage in more trade together, their governments also have much more peaceful relationships because the people see each other as, as um, not as strangers, but as people who come together in, in voluntary cooperation. Professor Davis, you say that uh, societies that cooperate more willingly are societies that are more prosperous. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, <clears throat> what what we see is um, a role for government in in protecting property rights, preventing people from harming each other. Also, in lesser developed countries, government seems to have a beneficial role in establishing infrastructure building roads and bridges and electrical grids and this sort of thing, but then stepping aside and letting the people um, voluntarily come together and, and build the economy. And the reason that mix seems to work so well is because there are some things that require the, the power uh, of government building a road system is something that is is a huge undertaking that's more easier for a governmental entity that can use coercion than it is for for individuals in a marketplace um so too protecting property rights but if you leave everything else to the individuals what happens is you get this dynamic um, interaction going on where we try different things and I come up with an idea for a product and I put it out in the marketplace and if you like it, you buy it and that puts more resources in my pocket to produce more of this product. Conversely, if I produce this product and I put it out in the marketplace and you don't like it, you starve me of resources, and now I've got to go figure out something else to do, something else that will make you happy, that will encourage you to give me your money. And so this, this voluntary cooperation causes economies to grow much better precisely because it, it fuels a trial and error of, it gives me an incentive to figure out what you want and to give you that, and gives you an incentive to figure out what I want and give me that. Uh, socialist and communist governments claim that they can actually build better societies, juster societies, and even more prosperous societies by uh, coercing uh, the collectivity, coercing people to cooperate. Uh, does, does this work? Yeah, it, it doesn't. And oddly, what you find is people who are most enamored of communist and socialist systems are people who have not lived under communist or socialist systems. If you ask the people who live under the systems, largely they say these are, these are poor systems to live under. And I think the difference comes to this. When you look at, at communism or socialism in theory, it looks wonderful that we're all going to live in peace and harmony and we're gonna do what's best for the common good and all of that. But in fact, that whole model ignores um, what's true about human behavior. And what's true about human behavior is that we each seek to do what's in our own self-interest. I want to do what's in my self-interest. You want to do what's in your self-interest. And if we put ourselves in a socialist environment where the government has tremendous powers of coercion, all of a sudden, I have an incentive not to do what's good for you so that you voluntarily give me your money, but rather to do what's good for the government so I can coerce, convince them to force you to give me your money. And what happens in the socialist environment in practice is instead of us all living together in peace and harmony, some of us who can co-opt co the government end up co-opting the government for their own benefit to the, to the, uh, to the harm of everybody else. Uh, taxes are a form of coercion. Do they work? Do they, they make cooperation better or taxes can actually be detrimental? Yeah, that's a good question. And this goes back to the appropriate role of government. If, if the appropriate role of government is in protecting property rights, and that's basically all, then of course we need taxes. We have to pay for a judicial system. We have to pay for a police force, but, but that's the extent. And you know, we can look at the history in the United States. Our, federal tax rate 
<clears throat> was about 1% for many decades uh, of our existence. It wasn't until the government started doing things that were beyond simply protecting property rights that our tax rate exploded from 1% to the current is around 23 to 25%. And that extra 20, 23, 24 percentage points of taxes are all going to things that are government coercion, not in a good sense of protecting property rights and preventing people from harming each other, but government coercion in a bad sense, government deciding for us what sorts of goods and services we should have rather than us deciding that for ourselves. Does this mean that if we had governments that intervened less in the economy, that coerced, uh, coerced less the individual, we would have more prosperous societies? Generally, that's correct. Most governments go air in becoming too large. There are some governments, and people point, for example, to, uh, to places where governments have failed, and they say things like, well, if less government is good, what about, what about countries like Afghanistan, where they have virtually no government? And there, the problem is you've gone to the opposite extreme. Too little government can be bad, too much government can be bad as well. The problem is, the right amount of government, generally speaking, is much less than the, than the amount of government uh, countries typically have. You have a very um, interesting metaphor in your book. It says that uh, the busy bodies have become busy bullies. Um, I, I found it rather fascinating. Could you explain that to us? Yes. The, the idea of a busybody is someone who puts their nose in your business. So think about your neighbor who doesn't like how you live your life and your neighbor is going to say things about you should do things differently. This is the busy buddy and we all experience this, right? You come home from college for and have dinner with your, your extended family and your extended family has opinions as to how you should be living your life and what you should be doing. This is busy buddy. The problem here is when you combine a busy buddy with a government, and all of a sudden, the busybodies can turn to government and co-opt the government to force you to behave the way they want you to behave. For example, here in Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia decided that, um, that young people were drinking too much uh, uh, sodas, uh, Coke and Pepsi and this sort of thing. And so the, the busybodies co-opted the, the city government and they said, OK, city government, these young people should not be drinking these drinks. Put a tax on it. Make it more expensive so they can't afford this. It, this is an example of, of the busy buddy becoming a busy bully, using the government to force other people to behave the way that the busy buddies think they should behave. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, this, the busy buddy is invoking a sense of inequality, that my opinion as to how you should behave is superior to your opinion as to how you should behave, and the government should honor my opinion, not yours. I do want to thank you, uh, Professor Anthony Davis, for this conversation, and, uh, and thank you for inviting us to read your book on coercion and cooperation. My pleasure, thank you. Y a usted, amigo televidente, que hace posible este programa, se lo agradezco también. Esto es todo por hoy, pero no se le olvide. Nos vemos la próxima.